What's the biggest challenge the country is facing? Republicans and Democrats may differ on that answer, but the majority of Americans believe that inflation is the most pressing issue facing the country. A new Pew survey finds 93% of Americans agree that inflation is a problem, while 70% believe it's a very big problem in the country. Inflation seems to be a higher concern for Republicans than Democrats. Democrats are more concerned about guns, affordable health care, and climate change. Republicans' biggest concerns are inflation and illegal immigration. Inflation remains near a 40-year high, and getting it under control won't be easy, says Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. The state of the economy is putting many household budgets in a vice. Record high gas prices are forcing Americans to cut spending in different places. The cost of living for most Americans has increased tremendously over the past year. Some experts say that the consumer price index doesn't tell the whole story when it comes to true inflation. Here to discuss, we have Ohio Congressman Bill Johnson. Congressman Bill Johnson, thank you so much for joining us on the Capitol Report again. Thank you very much. Good to be with you today. Congressman, some say that the 8.3% inflation number uh, is a bit deceiving with so many essentials uh, increasing uh, 20 to 30% from food to airline tickets, uh, of course, gas prices. Is there any end in sight to all of this? Well, I, I, I certainly don't see an end in sight unless the Biden administration reverses course. There's two primary reasons that, uh, that inflation is going through the roof. One, of course, is the massive amounts of money that the Biden administration has spent, put into the system. Anytime there is this many, uh, this much cash, this many dollars floating around in our economy, it devalues the dollar. Things that you pay a dollar for today, you're going to pay two and three dollars for tomorrow because there's simply so much cash in the system. We can't continue that kind of reckless spending. Uh, and the other issue is energy. I mean, energy is at the center of much of this inflation problem. Uh, it takes energy to produce products. It takes energy to, to get products to market. It takes energy to fuel your car, uh, to get back and forth to, uh, to work or to the hospital or wherever you're going. It takes energy to, to, to run our businesses, to, uh, uh, to heat and cool and cook our food at home. I mean, energy is at the is at the forefront of this, and the Biden administration's policies have made us no longer energy independent and dependent upon countries like Venezuela and Iran, uh, and even until a few weeks ago, Russia for our energy resources. That's crazy. Uh, he needs to reverse course if he wants to solve this inflation problem. Congressman, it's looking. Um very, very likely that the Republicans will take uh, at least the House of Representatives, the majority. How much do you think if that does happen, you guys will be able to actually get done uh, with a lame duck president? Well, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, if, if the House and the Senate, uh, uh, Lord willing, if the Senate also flips, uh, the Biden administration is going to have to work with Congress. Uh, he's tried his radical left agenda towards socialism and the Green New Deal and uh, everything else that you can imagine that's created crisis after crisis after crisis. But if he has to work with a Republican majority in both the House and the Senate, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to actually get some things done. Certainly put a check on his administration's reckless policies, but, uh, but, but there are even Democrats here that, that know that we're heading in the wrong direction. You know, I'm a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus, and, and these are both Republicans and Democrats that, uh, that, that have a common belief that we should be putting America first. And so I, I think there is optimism if we can get both chambers of the Congress. We always like to take a little bit of a straw poll. Uh, what have you been hearing from your people in the 6th District of Ohio uh, with regard to the economy? Uh, inflation is the number one topic on everybody's lips. I mean, there are a lot of concerns, obviously. Uh, when you look at the crises that are out there, we've got, a, uh, obviously, the inflation crisis, the border crisis, the energy crisis, uh, the crisis now with food shortages, the national security crisis, the crime crisis. Uh, it seems like every time you turn the, the corner, uh, the Biden administration has created another crisis. 
But clearly, the most important issue to the people that I represent are the skyrocketing cost of gasoline at the pump and the skyrocketing cost of groceries and the availability uh, of products, including groceries, on the shelves. That's a big, big concern. Congressman Bill Johnson, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day, my friend. Elon Musk's Twitter deal is on hold. The billionaire tech mogul says he's waiting for confirmation that bots or fake accounts make up only less than 5% of users. In a recent filing, Twitter estimated that false or spam accounts represented fewer than 5% of its monetizable daily active users during the first quarter. That estimate comes from Twitter's own internal review. Musk stated on Twitter that he's still committed to the acquisition. Actual user numbers could affect the valuation of the company. The 30th anniversary of the public introduction of Falun Dafa, an ancient spiritual practice originating in China. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill have sent out certificates to honor the day as the celebration sweeps across the world. NTD's Melina Wisecup has more details on the significance of this day in history. On this day, 30 years ago, people for the first time began to learn the significance of the three words truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance, the core principles of the spiritual discipline Falun Dafa. I feel like I, I waited for Falun Dafa for such a long time. Um, so I was born just after three years so, since uh, Falun Dafa was um, introduced to the world. So I feel very lucky to be born in such a wonderful period in history. To celebrate this time in history, a group of Falun Dafa practitioners gathered in front of the U.S. Capitol. They played music, sang, and displayed elements of traditional Chinese culture, catching the attention of bystanders. Yeah, I like it. In fact, I, I kind of like Chinese culture. I've I just think it's wonderful. It makes me want to join them. <laughs> this celebration in D.C. is joined by thousands more of its kind around the world. For decades, more and more people have come to learn the practice surpassing the differences of race, gender, religion, ethnicity, and age. The practice has spread to about 100 million people around the world. Many of them practice on a daily basis, and they tell us that it really has benefits for their mind and their body. We spoke to someone who's been practicing Falun Dafa for more than 20 years. In his own words, here's how he told us his experience has been. Actually, it is very warm. It's almost like... Uh, a flow of hot air inside me is flowing all over my body. And, and for those who are newer to the practice, they share a similar story. It was, I, I can feel the energy when I move, and that's what I love. And I feel like Falun Dafa gives me like a moral compass, and I can be a better student, a better wife, a better daughter, so it, it's really wonderful. Members of Congress today celebrating with them, some sending out letters and certificates. Congresswoman Rochester writing, by practicing these principles, individuals find calmness and optimism, as well as an understanding about life and the universe around them. And another, Congressman Trone writing, your efforts to promote the betterment of humanity through your stories and spiritual education are essential to building a stronger community. And other lawmakers are calling for an end to the persecution against the practice that's dragged on in China for 23 years. Senator Rubio's office writing in a tweet, On Falun Dafa Day, Senator Rubio stands with those who peacefully practice their faith and calls for an end to the persecution of Falun Gong. It's just a shame that people can't feel and act and practice and do whatever they feel is in their heart. So I think, you know, I think it's something that should change. But despite the Chinese government's attempts to eradicate the practice, it has spread throughout the world and is now practiced in over 100 countries. Practitioners today celebrating the opportunity to learn this practice to guide their self-improvement. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Wisecup, NTD News. You may or may not have heard of Falun Dafa, and with so much propaganda coming out of China to defame the group, we thought World Falun Dafa Day would be a good time to find out more about it. Our next guest is Levi Browdy, the executive director of the Falun Dafa Information Center, a volunteer nonprofit organization that provides information on the persecution of Falun Gong in China. And we're happy to have Levi on with us. Levi Browdy, thank you so much for joining us on the Capitol Report. Thanks so much for having me. Levi, today is World Falun Dafa Day. Uh, for those who might be unfamiliar with Falun Dafa, also known as Falun Gong, could you tell us about it and what is the significance of this day? 
Sure. Uh, Falun Dafa is a Buddhist-based uh, spiritual practice uh, from China, and it's really centered around three tenets, truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. It has a meditation component, a slow motion exercise component, and really studying of these tenets and trying to adopt those into your life. That's really the practice of Falun Gong. Um, practices like this have been passed down in China for thousands of years privately, uh, but Falun Gong was first introduced to the public in 1992, and that is why today is significant. Um, 30 years ago today, in a humble little schoolhouse in northeast China, uh, Mr. Li Hongzhu, the founder of Falun Gong, uh, gave his first class on Falun Dafa. And so every year after that, we've celebrated this day as, as World Falun Dafa Day, it's really to celebrate that event, the first class of, of Falun Gong being taught to the public. And a quick note to your viewers, you might hear me say Falun, Do Falun Dafa, Falun Gong. It's really the same thing. Falun Gong is a, a more colloquial way to refer to the spiritual practice, Falun Dafa is its formal name. It means the same thing. And you mentioned the uh, slow moving exercises, the spiritual component. What type of benefits have uh, people who practice Falun Dafa received? Well, that really is an interesting story because this is one of the reasons Falun Gong really exploded on uh, uh, throughout China. Uh, became very, very popular very, very quickly was because, and there wasn't really advertisements or things like that. It was really just people telling their friends and family, hey, I just learned this thing called Falun Gong. You should check it out. It really spread because people were having tremendous health benefits. E everything from being able to sleep better and eat better and just feel better about their, their mind and body to f to addressing real chronic or really difficult health problems. And that's how the practice really started to spread throughout China is, is, is the health benefits that people were, were receiving. Levi, we know that the Chinese regime uh, has cracked down on Falun Gong and has also gone to great lengths to demonize uh, this group. If you could tell us, why did this uh, crackdown happen in the first place? Well, it was really a perfect storm of three factors. One was the size. There were 100 million people practicing Falun Gong. That's one out of every 13 people in the country. And so that number of people doing anything is going to make some communist leaders nervous. There was the traditional culture component. Falun Gong really came out of the heartland of traditional Chinese culture in a time when the Chinese regime had spent decades trying to stamp out that culture and force Marxism on the people. So those two fact were those two issues were a factor, but really the the third factor, which is really the overriding factor, the the factor that really pushed and started the persecution, came down to one man. His name is John Zemin, and he was the leader of the the Communist Party at that time. He had come to power in the wake of the Tiananmen Square massacre in eighty nine. He didn't have a lot of credibility among his peers. Um, he was really looking to build up a power base, sort of a cult of personality around himself, much like many of his predecessors, like Deng Xiaoping and Mao Zedong had done. And the way you do that in the communist regime is you pick a target, you make them a public enemy, and you build a, a huge political campaign uh, to go after that enemy. And so he chose Falun Gong. He thought they would be an easy target. So it was really those three factors, size, traditional values, but really the overriding factor is John Jiman hoping to build up a power base of his own, and he demonized Falun Gong and built a political campaign around destroying them. And that's really how the persecution started. Levi, does this persecution differ at all from the persecution, say, against the Uyghurs or the uh, Tibetans? Um, it it does because of when you when you, you have to understand about Falun Gong is like it's not like an ethnic minority like the Uyghurs or the Tibetans, or is it uh, limited to a certain region of China? Falun Gong is everywhere in China. I mean, 100 million people were practicing, and it was in the militaries, in the government, housewives, professors, I mean, farmers. It was, it was trying to go after Falun Gong is like in America trying to target Catholics or, you know, um, other sort of religious beliefs here. It's, you can't separate Falun Gong from, from the Chinese people. And so when they, when they went after Falun Gong, they were really sort of taking an entire section of of Chinese society and demonizing them and going after them. And I think you also have to understand with Falun Gong is that over the last 20 years, in, in their efforts to peacefully resist and put an end to this persecution, they have become one of the world's leading whistleblowers of the crimes of the CCP. Not just the crimes against Falun Gong practitioners, which have been many, but really Falun Gong has been on the forefront of exposing the CCP crimes throughout their history. And so the the nature of the persecution, whereas it started as a persecution of religious minority for political purposes, 
as Falun Gong became more adept at being a whistleblower and really calling out the CCP on the world stage, the persecution became a desperate struggle to silence that voice. And in that way, it is also very different because the CCP sees Falun Gong as is the number one whistleblower, really, um, for exposing it, and therefore the most dangerous to to its rule. It's really fascinating to you know what you're saying. It sounds like there's Falun Gong practitioners in every um, facet of of Chinese society, from from the government all the way down. Which you know they probably understand the CCP better than anybody as well. Um, mm -hmm. Which, to my next question, do you think this persecution justifies uh, swift action from the United States government, much like we've seen in response to the Uyghur genocide? It really, it really should. I mean, if you look at the nature of the persecution, you're talking, again, tens of millions of people who are fired from their jobs, kicked out of school, are at, are at risk for arbitrary detention, being put into a labor camp, a black jail, a prison where they're horrifically tortured. You know, thousands upon thousands have been killed among this persecution. So it's absolutely horrific and it's in the millions. And so immediate action is required by the U.S. government. They have done some things that have been very good. For example, the sanctions done by this administration and the previous administration, they both sanctioned a Chinese official for persecuting Falun Gong. And that sent ripple effects throughout China and actually had some positive impacts in different areas where people started to get scared that they're going to be on a list and targeted by the, Chinese, by the U.S. government. Um, so it had real impact. There is legislation in front of our Congress right now to stop um, or curtail um, the horrific crime of forced organ harvesting, which if your viewers may not be familiar with, that is the practice that is prolific in China where they take prisoners of conscience, primarily Falun Gong people, they pre-screen them, and then they kill them when they need a vital organ and do an organ transplant of a, someone who needs the, needs the organ. This is a way that they have murdered many, many Falun Gong practitioners, and it's also a huge business. So there is, there is acts before our Congress right now to try and put an end to that, and that kind of legislation, something that really has teeth, is really very important. Wow, the thought of organ harvesting is is horrific. Levi Browdy, um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. The crisis on the southern border is alarming both Democrats and Republicans. The border state of Arizona is a hot spot for illegal crossings. Andrew Gould was an Arizona Supreme Court judge and is running for the state's attorney general position. We had a chance to speak to him about how to turn around the massive flow of illegal immigration and he also weighs in on the Supreme Court protests. Here's a look. Andrew Gould, thank you so much for joining us in the Capitol Report. Thank you, Steve. Andrew, if you get elected as Arizona's next attorney general, what steps would you take to secure the border? We need to approach it from a state law perspective. I have a plan for a no trespassing zone, and it's very simple. We simply enforce our state laws on state and private land where we have jurisdiction. Supreme Court has said that we don't have authority to enforce federal immigration laws, but we do have authority to enforce our criminal laws. I've spoken to sheriffs throughout the state. I was a prosecutor and judge on the border in Yuma for many, many years. And there's pinch points where the caravans and the cartels come across where they first enter on state and private land. We're doing this on a small scale, but we need to expand it. Uh, we have cameras, drones, patrols. When they first step on state land, we arrest for trespass, and then we search incident to arrest. We have authority to do that. We seize the guns, the drugs, the fentanyl, and for the cartel members who are drug trafficking, human trafficking, we use that evidence to prosecute them. For the people that are coming into the country illegally, we then arrest them for a variety of crimes, including trespass, disorderly conduct, possessing forged documents, criminal damage. Some of those are misdemeanors, some of them are felonies. And we take those uh, people that we arrest and put them in two groups. The first group are people who have been removed before or have a prior conviction for legal entry. We give them prison sentences. And then the other group, which is gonna be the largest group, we give them a plea offer. You can go to prison, or we can put you on an undesignated offense, which is a technical term, but it allows you to earn a misdemeanor if you successfully complete probation with two conditions, obey all laws and voluntarily return to Mexico. 
Now, I just want to switch gears here a little bit and ask you, as a former Supreme Court judge in Arizona, um, just to get your thoughts on, on what we're seeing play out with these protests at the Supreme Court justices' homes um, on the federal level, where is the line between exercising your First Amendment right to protest and breaking the law? This has gone way past the line. But let me tell you, I was a judge in our state Supreme Court. You have to be able to sit and reflect and think and discuss cases with your colleagues. Going to the homes of justices and threatening them, that's gone way beyond the right of protest. Uh, you know, I've been through this. I, I mean, I've, I've made decisions where I've received protests. I, we made a decision in Arizona or we had to leave the courthouse early on many occasions, but those were always after the decision was issued. This is before. And there's no question that it's an attempt to influence those justices and change the decision. This is an assault on an institution. It's had its faults, but we have all respected. And now I fear, Steve, this has done irreparable harm to that court. I can't imagine being a judge on probably the biggest case of our time, having people come out threatening you, coming to your house, intimidating your family, trying to get you to change your vote. I, I'm telling you, it makes me so angry to see this. It's just a destruction. It's the idea that if you don't like what a court is doing or the police are doing because you don't like the agenda that is pushing or the result, you just attack the institution and destroy it. Andrew Gould, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Steve.